Hello, all my amazing GovConverters. We have a special treat today. We have Ricky Howard here, who is a retired military member, and I'm gonna let him share more about that. And he has an awesome, 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 awesome website for y'all to go to, um, dodcontract.com. He has a DOD Contract Academy, and I'm telling you now, get ready, because you're going to wanna watch this all the way to the end. So Ricky, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Kizzy. Yeah, that's a, an amazing endorsement there. Oh, well, hey, it's 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 spot on because you you got to share with us, you know, about your military background and your connection to acquisitions. Because I, hey, as much as I love it and as much as I've been in GovCon for fifteen years, I have neither. Well, uh, you know a considerable amount of uh, about acquisitions and federal purchasing. And if anyone does go check out my podcast, you are one of our most popular guests on that episode. So you can uh, you can look for Dr. Kizzy Pox uh, <laughs> uh, on the uh, website or on the um, episode links. But yeah, no, I, I'd be more than happy to talk a little bit about uh, my career and everything and see where the conversation takes us. Well, definitely, because I know that there's a lot of veterans who are, you know, wonder like, what do I do after I retire? Or, you know, can I really go from being in uniform to getting millions of dollars of contracts? Because I heard about this service disabled set aside thing. Mm -hmm. so please share with us like your experience and how things really work. Yeah, no, we, we can definitely hit that up. Uh, yeah. So I spent 20 years in the Air Force and First half of that was flying, and I got some flying memorabilia uh, behind me. I flew uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance aircraft. So, um, you know, 9-11 kicked off when I first came in. So that was, I mean, I was pretty much deployed for that first 10 years uh, flying missions. And um, then as I went through and, you know, met my wife and whatnot, uh, we ended up switching. So I switched careers about halfway through and went into acquisitions. And acquisitions is the profession of putting companies on contract uh, for anyone that's not familiar with that. And uh, and I'm sure you you talk to your audience a lot about, you know, who actually buys in the government. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, 99.9% .9 of people you talk to in the government probably can't buy what you're selling. You know, depends on depends on the product or solution. But um, especially, you know, in the military, we have an acquisitions uh, career force. So we have contracting officers, which have warrants, and they are the ones that can legally put you on contract. And then we have uh, program teams, program managers. I was a program manager and they're the leaders of the acquisitions effort. So, you know, if a company, whether it's a small business selling, you know, cybersecurity solutions or, you know, landscaping or, you know, maybe something bigger, like we're, we're building satellite technology, weapon system technology, you're going to have a team and a program manager in charge of all of that. So uh, that's what I did. So I was, uh, you know, putting companies on contract with my contracting officers, managing those, uh, through the life cycle and got to do a lot of different things like, you know, a lot of technology development and a lot of foreign military sales. And uh, I guess one of the things that I noticed when I was in is although I wanted to put small businesses on contract because they typically had the, they had very innovative solutions. So, you know, we need big companies. We do um, for a lot of things, but when we're talking about whether it's an innovative uh, technology and we had a lot of the MIT's, startups out there, a lot of the, you know, uh, companies that have just developed something really interesting, or even just a service provider, like a landscaping company, it's the small businesses that are willing to adapt, especially with military uh, purchasing and Department of Defense purchasing, you know, they were willing to adapt to what we needed, you know, make changes, they were really motivated to work with us. Um, and it was really easy to, uh, you know, take a great technology with them and, and work with them on exactly what we needed. But very few small businesses were actually even aware that the government was behind what, you know, they sold. Because um, most people think weapons and bullets and things like that. They're not th thinking about accounting services or legal or, you know, construction or, you know, a lot of those things. So I wanted to get out um, and start helping some of those small businesses understand the process, understand that the opportunity is there, teach them what they really need to do uh, to win those contracts and stuff. So I retired and started my consulting business and the podcast, and then we met and, and here we are. So thanks for having me on. Well, of course. And I, and I love this because you hit on some very important areas that there, there are things that the government wants to buy the need to be flexible as well as knowing that the government wants to buy 
because it's some people don't know. I think you said something earlier around one fewer than one percent of businesses sell to the government. Could you kind of uh, elaborate? Yeah, on and I don't have I don't have the figures in front of me right now, but. One thing that's very different about the way the government makes purchases and about federal spending is that it's all public knowledge. It's We call it the public sector, right? So everything the government does, with the exception of some classified stuff, but even most of the classified things they're buying, that, that contracts themselves aren't classified. And so all of that is publicly available information. And there are a lot of different websites you can go to to kind of look at that. There are some paid ones you can. can. But at the end of the day, we know how much the government spends each year who they're spending it on, like what companies are on contract, what they're buying, how they're buying, who's buying what. And so in 2021, the last numbers I saw, it was around, it was a little over $150 billion that the US federal government spent just on small business contracts. So just with small businesses. Now, if you look at that, and by the way, over half of that was Department of Defense spending. So uh, and the reason is the, the SBA actually has, uh, they have projected percentages of the contracts that every government agency is going to be um, you know, initiating um, that they have to meet for small businesses. It's usually 23% or greater. So meaning, hey, uh, Air Force, 23% of your spending has to be on small businesses. So most uh, people just aren't aware that the government has to buy from small businesses. It's $150 billion just in over that just in 2021, $80 billion plus of that was DOD. And it's for everything that you could think of. We're not just talking about weapons and stuff. We're talking about every service, you, social media, you know, advertising. I mean, if you name it, I, I could probably find it and tell you how much you know they're spending and you know what you could potentially reasonably make depending on what your specialty is. Um, but yeah, less than half of one percent of small businesses are actually selling to the government, and we know that because we know. There are over 33 million small businesses in the U.S., and we know exactly how many small businesses sold to uh, the Department of Defense and other government agencies in 2021. So it's just a, a math drill. Um, so you know, the bottom line is you have a huge, um, a huge pool of customers out there that most people just aren't tapping into. And uh, the reason for that is you know knowledge, you know that it, it even exists, and federal procurement is not commercial sales. It's just, it's a completely different process, which is why people watch your YouTube channel and go to you all the time, you know, and people listen to our podcast. It's, it is, it is a different process, but it's understandable, you know, and because of all the information out there, we just have to understand you as a business owner, just have to understand how the government buys what you sell. And that's, that is what, you know, because a lot of pe companies are overwhelmed when they start looking at all of it. Some of them, have an idea. They think that, you know, they might see Sam.gov and think they, oh, I see all these solicitations. I'm just going to start writing proposals. It's not quite the way it works. Uh, um, so, you know, it's easy to either assume, make assumptions and fail or just to get overwhelmed. And, and what I'm trying to do, and I think what you're trying to do, at least in part, is just to make it simple and say, hey, this is this is the process. Let's have some understanding on, you know, what to expect. And, and these are the steps you need to take and you can be successful too and win some of those contracts. Yes. And, and what is the first step for someone to take, especially if someone is a, is a vet? What, is, what should they do? Yeah. And by the way, I have a lot of thoughts on what vets can, <laughs> vets can be doing when they get out because because there are so there's different set asides, like you mentioned. Right. Um, we can talk about those. I can tell you, I have never bought something from somebody because of a set aside. So don't now don't get scared if you've been going through 8A or you know trying to get your woman-owned small business or SDVOSB because those things can help you, right? But it's always the solution first, right? So I always, when putting my government hat on, I cared about who can solve my problem. So if I have a, a technology that needs to be developed to solve something, whether it's small business or other, who can solve that? Landscaping services, who can do that? Like prove to me that you can do the work. Now let's talk about okay, you're a service disabled vet, right? So I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but you know, the first question you asked is, hey, what's the first step? First step is, does the government even buy what you sell, right? So, you know, why even bother, <laughs> you know? And by the way, they almost always do, right? So uh, first thing I tell people is let's figure out how much the government spends each year on the product or solution or service that you provide. Um, and then we can, you know, there are, I think it's over 300 criteria that get published on most of these contracts. So, you know, we can take it down and start saying, okay, well, if the government spends, I'm making these numbers up, right? Because I don't have the thing in front of me, but, you know, we can go, okay, well, the government spends 
a billion dollars, let's say, in landscaping services. All right, how much of that's on small businesses, right? And you can say, oh, well, now 600 million of that is on small businesses. Okay, where is it? How are they making the purchases? So we can get pretty granular and you can kind of get an idea. We can look at competitors. We can get a really good idea of what you can expect to make once you get the ball rolling. So that's the first step. Do they buy what you sell? Kind of get an idea of um, you know, how much you think you can make each year. Look at some other small businesses if, if that's what you are. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, obviously you have to register your business, um, but it's putting a roadmap. So, uh, you know, the way I take people through it is if they buy what you sell, let's figure out who's buying what you sell. Let's focus on one agency, one or two or three agencies, depending on how big your team is, if you already have a company, um, and then start looking at uh, the purchasing mechanisms. You know, do they use GSA? Do they compete? Do they do sole source contracts? Do you qualify for a set aside? Because um, some of these set asides can, you know, if they're not familiar and who's buying what you sell. Now I'm focused on how they make purchases. Just if I do, usually you don't need a GSA schedule unless you're selling, you know, maybe office supplies or something, but we can see what the percentage is. So we can look in and I can tell you, Hey, you know, in your category, GSA, which is a contract vehicle, essentially that you can apply to be on. And it takes roughly six months or so. You don't want to, you don't want it. You don't need to be on there unless you need it. Right. So if we saw that 80% of purchases in your area was through GSA, well, that might be part of your plan going forward. That might be in your roadmap. If I see that 20% of purchases go through GSA, you don't need it. You, you, you don't. I mean, the, the facts speak for themselves. So we know that, um, or maybe it's your what you sell is wrapped up in bigger contracts, which would indicate a subcontracting plan. So I want to know what, and you want to know what the plan is for what you sell. And once we have that, once we know what maybe contracts we need, once we know um, you know, if we're going to be involved in competitions or if there is a lot of sole sourcing that goes on, set aside usage, we can see all the numbers. Then what we want to do is find opportunities, right? But, and this is different than maybe what, uh, well, your audience probably knows this, uh, but, you know, a lot of, I guess you could say one of the top complaints that I've heard from businesses that would approach us mm-hmm. is, hey, Rick, I've gone to Sam.gov, I registered my business, I see these solicitations for whatever the industry is, I'm writing proposals, I'm not winning anything, it's all rigged, these propo- these solicitations look like they're written for my competitors, and it's it's obviously rigged. And the thing is, it's not rigged, Right. But those proposals probably were written for your competitors. <laughs> and and I know that maybe sounds contradictory, but what we want to do is we want to, and how I help businesses is we find opportunities ahead of the solicitation. So when you get to the solicitation, the point that comes out, you just need to understand that there's a whole phase of acquisitions that comes before that called the market research phase. And it is the most important phase for any company, any company to be in if they're selling to the uh, government, you know, and I, I do have one client I sell their uh, software licenses and stuff for, and I can tell you, I'm in that, I'm solidly in that market research phase. And and that's where, you know, we kick butt and take names because p- I picture it like this. So I describe it. When the solicitation comes out, the handcuffs are on, right? So an acquisitions team has to be extremely careful not to show any preferential treatment to any business once the solicitation's out which in the solicitations, a request for proposal, a request for quote. It's like, hey, you're, I, we'll stay on landscaping services. I need Hanscom Air Force Base in Massachusetts needs a three-year landscaping contract. And here are the requirements. Um, proposals are due in two weeks, 10 paid for, you know, whatever it is. So that's that's a solicitation. But, you know, at that point, if you ask me as an acquisitions officer, if you ask the contracting officer any questions, if they even answer you, it's going to be probably through a post in sam.gov so everybody can see the answers. Because if they have a conversation with you at this point, well, now you're potentially getting preferential treatment um, that other companies aren't getting. Maybe you're getting information, you know, and that's, and the way everything's written is it's once the solicitation comes out, that's when a lot of that goes into effect because now you have requirements. Now you have something that's out there. But in the market research phase that comes before that, you know, if you have someone like me, that's the program manager, and let's say that I'm in charge of the landscaping contract for the base, I don't know anything about landscaping. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm my job is to put companies on contract for the government and manage those, and that's program management and contracting, and that's the skill set, right? So, and by the way, I and my counterparts over there, they have a hundred things to put on contract every year, right? This is not their skill set. So, how do they find out what needs to be in the solicitation? 
that's market research, right? They're going to reach out to businesses. They're going to say, because we do remember we have those um, 23% or, or better typically has to be with small businesses. So I want to know things like, can I set this aside for a small business? Um, so in order to do that, I know I have to know that there are small businesses out there that can do the work. Can I set it aside for a woman-owned small business, right? Well, again, I'm not going to do that unless I know that it's typically two, I want to say is what the, the regulations say, but I need to know there are a couple small businesses out there that are woman-owned that can at least do the work before we're going to set that aside. And, you know, of course, the reason is we don't want to duplicate the work, right? We need to be efficient as we can when we're putting someone on contract. But I also don't know, hey, what's the latest in technology? What are the best mowers out there, right? What are the best, is there something, maybe I have uh, some uh, type of, um, you know, environmentally friendly clauses I need to work with. Or maybe there's a, you know, machine out there that is better for the environment, right? So there's so much that they don't know. And that's where they're either doing their own research or companies are coming in. Savvy companies are finding out because they know that contract, maybe the last one's expiring. So they're in my office, you know, put my hat on again, right? They're in my office saying, hey, I know this contract's expiring. We're a small business. We have this environmentally friendly lawnmower that reduces emissions and blah, 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 blah. By the way, we can also do... Right? So now what you're doing, what these companies are doing is they're influencing what is going to go into that solicitation. And it's perfectly legal. It's perfectly legitimate. It's not rigged. You know, Even if I want to hire that company, it doesn't mean I'm going to. But what it means for that company, what it means for Kizzy's landscaping company is, well, hey, she just talked to me. Maybe she was the only one, right? Maybe she responded to a request for information. And now I've because she responded to that and had said, hey, I'm a small woman owned business. I am uh, I have these environmentally friendly machines that do X, Y, and Z. And I confirmed that with my team. Well, now when the solicitation comes out, it's set aside for a woman owned small business. I have a requirement for these machines that you know uh, are environmentally friendly, which maybe 99% of the other landscaping companies don't have. And I mean, hey, maybe she has certifications that she recommended. Now I'm putting those in there. So anything that you can get that office to put in there eliminates competition for you. So now only women-owned small businesses are going to apply. And, uh, you know, and if they don't, they have to partner with one, you know, a company that's not a woman-owned small business. Uh, you're just much more likely to win now. You know what the requirement is. You've talked to me and my team. You've suggested things. And I know you. And I probably like you. And as fair as we want everything to be, well, of course, Kizzy, you're very personable. So, of course, you know, the teams like you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but you can't, it's hard to eliminate the, the people out of the process. In fact, people, the people is everything in this process. It, it, okay. it is. And I, I so love this. And I know people listening, like their minds are like, whoa, because there's so much here. And I love all of this because you've highlighted how the process happens way over here. It's not even on the screen. Right. right. Exactly. To, oh, I see it on Sam. They There's so much more that happens. I love the emphasis on the market research because what he shared, what Ricky shared, I've done that. I've watched other companies do that. I learned from my mentors to do that. And it happens all the time. Even if somebody's working from home, there's still someone reaching out to emphasize, oh, well, we use these special machines or you know, we're, um, we have this special license. And then next thing you know, when that procurement comes out, it emphasizes these things because somebody took the time to really market themselves. And, and, it, and it's great. And then the other piece is you have to be likable. Yeah. And nobody, I mean, some people may be, get, may be able to get away with it if you kind of fake the funk or you, you offer something that's so specialized, but nobody wants to work with a vendor who's like not like a grinchy type person <laughs> right no no you're right and it's you know federal acquisitions isn't known for being a fast process right unless we're you know doing something like ota or sbir so more than likely if you're trying to push a deal through you're working with that program office over over a period of time so they're getting to know you you're even if it's during the bidding process the rfi process you're having meetings with them they're getting to know you. They're going to know if you're reliable, if you do what you say you're going to do, even as simple as, you know, um, showing up for a meeting on time or sending them, you know, a white paper when they request it, um, depending on, you know, the technology you're selling or what your solution is or the capability statement. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot that goes into it, but um, the relationships and the meetings and all of that are, are critically important in the market research. And yeah, it all comes together. Yeah, it's so key. And I love that you talked about the responsiveness, 
Um, like if somebody sends an email, you're immediately responsive, or if they ask for a white paper, I mean, these are the things like the biggest thing is follow instruction. Yeah. Period. If, mm -hmm. if there's a struggle with following instruction and don't get me wrong, like I hate rules, but I can follow instruction all day, every day. Right. But you have to follow instruction. If, if they say 12 point font Arial or Times New Roman, do not use anything else other than that. No. Nope. Say no phone calls, then don't call them. You know, if they say, you know, that, hey, I'm open to market research, submit for market research. And then this is when you call them. You never know. Maybe absolutely. Absolutely. The the only caveat that I would put on that is um, so for solicitations, like you are a million and one percent right. It's like you can't you, you get a page count. If you put an extra page in there, that page is getting thrown in the trash. Maybe the whole solicitation, right? If you're not uh, if you're not following, you know, the criteria that they have in there down to the letter, you're you're giving them reasons to um, either grade your proposal poorly or to not look at it at all. And, you know, in a um, in a competitive environment, you don't want that. Um, but if we if we take a step over into the market research phase, um, I would still say you're 95 percent right. I mean, you still want to follow the rules and not piss anyone off if you because, again, for that exact reason, it's about people and relationships and influence. Right. But you do have the ability there. You're not being graded on the RFI response or the source of sought solicitation to the like a proposal. There's a couple that, I, you know, in a weird category, I, I won't even get into that right now. But for the most part, we're talking about they're just doing market research. So um, I would still follow all of the rules. But if they don't ask me, and this is just my personal technique with my clients or me, if, if they're not asking me, and they, they might not be for how I think they should put it on contract, or um, if they're not asking me for the environmental machine, right, they might not even be aware that exists. I'm going to put that stuff politely in there, right? Like, hey, a couple of recommendations. Um, you know, if I was on GSA, I might say you might use GSA to put this on contract. Or if I had another contract vehicle like a NASA Soup or ITES or you name it, um, you might, you know, consider these mechanisms for putting me on contract. If I was 8A, um, I would absolutely, you know, some of these certifications allow for sole source contracting, which is con which is putting someone on contract without a competition, which, um, you know, is pretty difficult to do as a contracting team, <laughs> unless you have a reason. So that typically that's reserved for you have the only solution um, out there that we can put on contract, right? So um, that's rare, right? Because, you know, we live in a big world. A lot of people have a lot of, you know, different things. There are some unique uh, technologies and whatnot, but anyway, you can make it easier for the government to put you on contract. You want to let them know how uh, you've made it easy for them. So you could be 8A. Now you're letting them know, you're letting the contracting officer know, hey, you know, I could satisfy an 8A requirement and I could put you on contract a little bit easier. Um, maybe you have another contract with that agency, right? Like, hey, I'm on contract already with, you know, uh, Air Force Research Lab or Hanscom Air Force Base, PEO, C3, INN, I'm on this contract. Well, they might have a way to get to you through that contract. Um, so th there's lots of different ways. But if you have anything like that, you, you know, you can recommend it. Or if you don't, be like, hey, I recommend an open competition because you don't want this thing to get set aside for GSA if you don't have any of that. And you can recommend that too. So I do like to insert some things there to make sure that I'm trying to get them into the solicitation at the end but only during the RFI sources sought uh, part of the market research phase. This is where it allows companies to really, this is where you really highlight your differentiators. Those lovely yeah. differentiators you want to throw on your capabilities, put on your website or tell your yeah. friends and family. This is where they come out about the equipment or the background of your team or the partnerships that you have. I know for some opportunities, they love it if you're connected to HBCUs or to certain colleges, or they love that maybe you're connected to like a Google. They mm -hmm. love those kinds of things. And this is where you emphasize that. Or if you have certain certificates, they will love this. And then it yeah. you know, could definitely start to shape that potential opportunity, really giving you a leg up. So instead of being frustrated, man, this is set aside for my competition. Now it's kind of set aside for you in some ways. And yep. it happens. It's, it's happened for my clients. It's happened for my businesses. 
And it just, it can definitely happen by putting in the work. That's what's key yeah. with this. No, it really is. It really is. And then of course, once you're on contract, mm -hmm. um, I always say that the easiest way to sell the government is once you're already on contract, because now you have a relationship in place. You probably have a contract in place. So regardless of what you sell, you know, Hey, you know, you have some area there that, you know, if it's the landscaping example, again, you know, that, you know, this isn't being done over here. Maybe we can add that to the contract or, Hey, you know, you can always have the conversation and see if there's any need. And then you can ask them, do you have anyone you can recommend to me within, you know, in other offices that could use our service if it's our cybersecurity services, you know, everyone needs them. And, you know, typically we want, I mean, I can remember the savvy companies would always ask me that and I'd help them, you know, I'd be like, Hey, you know, my buddy over here is, you know, has something coming up, or maybe you should look at this contract vehicle or now that you mention it, I wasn't because everyone's busy, right? They're not thinking about your next sale or your, uh, or your QBR, right? They're thinking about the mission. If it's the military, um, you know, what the, what the next thing is on their plate on the government side. Um, but if you ask them, they'll start thinking, they'll pause to think about it, especially if they like you and they think you do good work. They're gonna they're gonna help you out. So I mean, there's a lot of work to be uh, gained while you're when you're on contract with the government too, just by talking to people and having those conversations. Which is excellent to hear because there have been some. Um, I know some of my students had the mindset of just like, oh, it's the government. I have to be very proper. I have to just come across like as this ultra business owner, and you know, you just reinforce what I shared, and it's we're all people, right. And, and that's what's important is we do business with people as long as you have the solution that is needed. And that's what's key. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And um, what, is, what is something that those um, watching today could immediately do? Besides, of course, going to dodcontract.com <laughs> and listening to your podcast at DOD Contract Academy. I mean, of course, I'm a guest, but in addition to that yeah. on the podcast, he has amazing information because you know one of the again one of the reasons I have you on here. You're retired lieutenant colonel. You're a pilot. You're in acquisitions. These are all things that we see in the movies, or maybe we have like a cousin, cousins, cousins, cousin. But none of I mean I, I have no connection or background to the wealth of knowledge and experience that you have. And you know I'm grateful for you. Grateful for your service. And so please, everyone, go to these places, dodcontract.com, check out the contract, DOD Contract Academy podcast, because you bring all of this out, in, in not just from yourself, but from all of your guests. And the way to keep growing and growing and growing as a business owner, especially in this space, is to continuously learn, because it's not just, this is how things are done, and then that's it. Like, there's this constant learning. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be happy to point some people in the right direction. And then I do want to say I was a navigator, not a pilot. So I don't want uh, all oh. my uh, all my aviator buds uh, going, hey, man, you trying to <laughs> what you're trying to do there. Um, but uh, no, I had, I had a great time uh, flying. But um, yeah, there's a lot of free resources uh, that you can check out, right? So whether it's your channel or the podcast or whatnot, and certainly there are paid resources as well. And you can find those on probably both of our websites, I would imagine. But um, I would go to usaspending.gov to start out because that's a, a free website that walks through how the government is spending. And you can start taking a look by year. You can look by um, keywords. So you can start, you can go by NAICS codes. There's a lot of different criteria, which is a North American industry classification code, uh, but it will help you out. You can start typing in whatever it is you specialize in accounting and it's going to pull it up. And then you can start looking at that. Okay, well, how much is the government spending by year? And you can look at the agencies. It'll also list them out um, in order. It's not going to give you the contracting office, you know, and that's, you know, something that, you know, I help people walk people through, but it, it gives you a start. So now you can start going, okay, well, maybe the DOD is who I'm focused on, or it's the VA. You know, you can start looking at who's actually doing the spending, see how much of it's uh, uh, occurring each year. And that's going to give you a, a good inclination as to whether this is for you, right? Is there an opportunity there for what you're selling? Um, you know, cause there are, there are some things that the government buys, but it's in, it's, it, you know, they're not $20 million contracts out there. And you're going to see that, right? Um, a good example, we had a, um, a documentary film company as a client, right? And they came in and we started, you know, crunching the numbers for them. And at the end of the day, you know, the $20 million contracts weren't out there, but, 
you know, they could still expect to make, you know, we saw a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar purchases um, from the government. And, you know, no, it was, you know, more than that over time. But, you know, so they could expect they could expect a uh, additional line of income. And that's all they wanted, right? But if you were in it for, hey, potentially, I want to build up to those bigger contracts, well, you're going to get an idea if if that's the case for you or not. Right, which is good to know because often the size of the contract doesn't necessarily dictate your profit margin. And right. As time goes on, I mean, that's that's key is profit mm-hmm. margin and cash flow with your business. So it's great that you mentioned that. I mean, hey, if documentary companies can get government contracts pretty sure that you know many of you watching the same applies as well as there are those who are like look you know my main line of business is hair care products but i'm entrepreneurial mm-hmm. so now i sell cybersecurity and there are people who have gone off and done things like that mm-hmm. or their background is just drastically different than the business that they set up and if that's what someone's interested in it's it's great to do that i know i did that i'm a have a PhD in psychology. And Mm -hmm. most of what my main businesses, my government businesses do now is, is really become a lot of staffing. Yeah. In reality, it's a lot of it. And it's like, Hey, why not? You know, it's something of interest. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, part of what we do with our, um, our higher ticket courses or offers where we we have a five week launch program now where, you know, one of the first things we're doing is developing uh, the niche for the company. And, you know, when you really get into the details, and this is what's amazing about about selling to the government, is there's so much information out there. As long as you know where to look for it, you can really have a high probability of being successful if you go about it the right way. So, you know, if you take something like an accounting firm, right, you can go in and start looking at, well, you know, maybe, um, you know, you're doing bookkeeping or something along those lines. And, you know, when we dig into it, we see that because you can see in some cases how many offers are coming in on average as well. So when we look at the numbers for small businesses winning those type of contracts, we might see, well, hey, there's a little bit of money there, but you know, there's a lot of offers. It's highly competitive when we see how many offers are coming in. And then we may look at you know tax preparation services and see that, oh, well, on average, you're only getting two or three offers uh, per solicitation. Now, when you get down to that granular level of detail and you know the office, the exact office, the name of the people in there that are doing the purchasing, the path becomes a lot clearer. It becomes a lot more manageable, especially for a small business. Um, And yeah, I mean, that's it's really important. So um, that's where I would start. That's where I I push people. Uh, USA Spending, it's it's a decent website uh, for for a government run website. Um, Fairly, fairly easy to understand. It definitely is. And, and these yeah. are great first steps. They're easy first steps. Mm-hmm. They help build that confidence. And, you know, again, I thank you so much for being on here today, Ricky. And I want to reiterate again, everyone, to please go to dodcontract.com, check out DOD Contract Academy podcast, which is great. If you're traveling, you're working out, you're at an airport, listen to a podcast. Um, you're always welcome to go to profitablecontracts.co. I have always have a free download for all my amazing GovCon winners. And again, I just want to thank you so much. And if anyone wants to connect with you outside of the website or the podcast, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, yeah, so they could send me an email, uh, richard at richardchoward.com. Um, and they could also check me out on LinkedIn um, if they look up uh, Richard Howard and slap a Lieutenant Colonel retired at the end of it. They'll, uh, they'll find me on there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. And also I must say, cause y'all know this is how I end all my videos is don't forget before I, you know, finish my sentence, you got to <laughs> subscribe. Y'all got to hit the notification button, like share all of those amazing things. And don't forget everything is possible. <laughs> <laughs>